And now, from beyond our dimension, this is the Jeff Mara Podcast. Here's Jeff. My special guest is Michael Cremo, member of the World Archaeological Congress, the European Association of Archaeologists, as well as an associate member of the Bhakti Vedanta Institute, specializing in history and philosophy of science. He is an author of many books, including Forbidden Archaeology, The Hidden History of the Human Race, Human Devolution, A Vedic Alternative to Darwin's Theory, and more. Michael, thank you so much for joining me today, and welcome. Good to be with you, Jeff, and all your listeners and viewers. Michael, would it be fair to say that your interest in human history is a result of your spiritual journey of the Vedic texts? Yes, I would say that. That's a a big part of it. I could also say I've been influenced a, a little bit by my upbringing. My father was a military intelligence officer. And yeah, that meant a few things for me as I was growing up. I mean, one thing it meant was moving to lots of different places in the United States and abroad. You know, in my high school years, I was living in Europe. And that exposure to different cultures and ways of life and different people with different ideas had a, an influence on me. And I also say that my uh, family's involvement in the intelligence business uh, gave me the idea that there is something to hidden knowledge. You know, there are things going on in the world that many people simply don't know about. So those things... I think really influenced me as well, but it was specifically my encounter with the ancient wisdom system of India, the Vedic system of knowledge that uh, really inspired a lot of my work. Can you start with how you went through archaeological journals that were published before Darwin's work that was generally accepted? Well, uh, here's uh, the reason I did that. In the Vedic histories, which are called the Puranas, there are descriptions of human populations existing on Earth millions of years ago. And the same idea of extreme human antiquity is found not just in the Vedas, but many of the ancient wisdom traditions uh, down through history and the world. So I was wondering, are these accounts simply some kind of mythology that was invented by whoever put these texts together? Or was there perhaps some factual basis for this idea? And That's what got me looking into the history of archaeology, because, you know, if you look in the current textbooks, you see only the discoveries that support the now prominent idea that human beings appeared fairly late in the history of life on Earth, Uh, were said to have evolved from more primitive ape-like creatures and the first human beings like us came into existence less than 300,000 years ago. So uh, what I decided to do was I, I just had some suspicion that there may be more to the history of archaeology than what's in the current textbooks. So I started looking into the original archaeological reports and reports of other scientists who were digging into the earth, geologists, paleontologists, and others. And when I did that, I was astonished to find that there were many reports by professional scientists published in the professional scientific literature that were consistent with the idea that humans had been present on this planet for many millions of years. So 
uh, I collected those reports and published them in the book, Forbidden Archaeology, because my question was, if these things are actually there in the original scientific literature, then why aren't they in today's textbooks? So that's how I got into studying these reports. And what they revealed was something different than what Charles Darwin and his modern followers uh, have been telling us. And do you think at the time that Darwin's theories became popular, science was at a point where they were trying to break away from religion and the creationists, so they just like took a hard right turn away from that and all followed in line with Darwin? Well, it's something that started uh, earlier than Darwin. I think you have to go back about four or five centuries before that. <clears throat> and uh, at that time, if you had looked at the world of science in the 14th century or the 13th century in Europe, you would have found scientists investigating mystical phenomena, uh, subtle energies, vital forces, the action of higher spiritual intelligence on the observable world around us. You would have found uh, a science that is somewhat different than the science we have today. And that's a result of some decisions that uh, prominent scientists and groups of scientists made several centuries ago, they decided <clears throat> or made a decision to set aside the mystical stuff and just concentrate on ordinary matter operating according to physical laws that could be expressed mathematically. So that was very productive in a way for science because by focusing on the ordinary material elements and leaving out all the subtle energies and spiritual elements and the operation of gods and higher intelligence on the world, they were able to make a lot of progress in understanding exactly how the ordinary physical elements work. And based on that, they were able to come up with technologies that were highly prized by governments and militaries. They were able to deliver, for example, new weapons with higher powers of destruction. Governments liked that, so they funded it. Uh, they were also able to come up with pharmaceuticals that uh, somehow or other were uh, able to quickly cure certain diseases. Now, they may have had all kinds of bad, by bad side effects, but uh, cor corporations liked that because they could market these pharmaceuticals to the general population and make huge profits. And it also resulted their their mastery of uh, material technology also resulted in their ability to produce items, machines, and things like that, that the general public liked. And therefore, corporations were very much into this. They wanted more and more of it. And we were all kind of complicit in it. I mean, the governments, they also like the tax revenues that were generated by all of this activity. So these things became gradually installed in the world of science. Uh, first, the first to fall, you could say, was astronomy. Uh, you know, we had Galileo coming in with his ideas. And then it expanded to physics and chemistry. And the final step, you could say, was Darwin introducing how 
you could explain the origin of species by a purely naturalistic physical process without invoking any kind of higher intelligence. So yeah, I, I would say uh, Darwin kind of represented the culmination of a process that had started several centuries earlier in Europe. But despite this progress, it was at the expense of having a complete picture of reality. It kind of left out a lot. And it really, without appeal, without being able to appeal to non-material substance or any type of higher intelligence, they've been unable to explain to this very day uh, important questions like the origin of consciousness. How do you get that from chemicals in the brain? Nobody has figured that out. They're trying. They continue to work on it, but they haven't figured it out. They'll admit it. The origin of life, the first single-celled organism. I mean, we, we may think they're very simple, but actually on the biomolecular level, they're very complex. And it's one of the remaining unsolved scientific questions, the origin of the first living thing on Earth. So they've been unable to answer a lot of fundamental questions. And the result of their idea that we're simply machines made of molecules in competition with each other for survival is that there are uh, increasing levels of violence in, in the world on all levels, on the level of nations, religions, races, so on and so forth. And plus, we're destroying our environment because of our unsustainable uh, industrial and consumer-oriented processes. So, yeah, there's been a lot of success by this focus on matter to the exclusion of consciousness and higher intelligence and non-material substances. But it's also created a lot of problems and left a lot of questions unanswered. I would think that if science actually came out and agreed with what our true history is, then they would be put into a position to also have to accept that we are conscious beings and not just these meat sacks walking around. Yeah, I think that's the ultimate uh, meaning. Uh, you know, I wrote a book, Forbidden Archaeology, which is about archaeological evidence, stones and bones that contradict the current theories of human origins by showing that humans like us have existed for a long time on this planet. We're not you know, the fairly recent product of evolution by natural selection. And the implication of that, you know, sometimes people ask me, well, so what? You know, whether we came into existence a few thousand years ago or a, a few million years ago, I mean, what difference does it make? Well, the difference it makes is this. The evidence that I've reported puts our human origins back so far in time that, and this was told to me by uh, one of the founders of the modern evolutionary theory of human origins. He said, if the evidence in your book is to be taken at face value, it would contradict not just our picture of human evolution, but the evolution of all the different forms of life on Earth. Because the evidence goes back not just millions, but tens of millions and even hundreds of millions of years, all the way back to the very beginnings of the history of life on Earth. And to me, that 
means we need new explanations for human origins. But before we even ask, where did human beings come from? We should first of all ask the question, what is a human being? Because otherwise, if we don't know what we're talking about, how do we know if we've explained it or not? And today, as I was mentioning previously, most scientists would say, well, you call it meat machines. I, I, I accept that. Or, you know, machines made of molecules in competition with each other for survival. Uh, I think there's more to it than that. I think there's a, a subtle mind element that can influence ordinary matter in ways that we can't explain by our laws of physics that can do amazing things like remote viewing, psychokinesis, mind over matter. And beyond that, there is a conscious self that is totally non-material, that's beyond mind, beyond matter. It has its own independent existence. And, you know, I think those things have to be part of any new explanation for human origins that we come up with. I would say ultimately we're beings of pure consciousness. And somehow or other we've come in contact with the energies of mind and matter, which kind of restrict consciousness uh, to some extent. And our human vehicle or the, the body of any type of living entity, plant or animal, insect, fish, whatever, is a vehicle for a conscious self. And the conscious self, if it properly uses the human vehicle, can understand what its real nature is and where it should be, which isn't in the world of matter. Michael, I believe science says that humans have been around a little less than 300,000 years. And I think your take is that we've been around for hundreds of millions of years. For those in my audience that are new to you, can you share with us some of your best evidence that shows that we've been around for such a long time? Yeah. Um, as you go further and further back in time, there's less evidence because of the geological record. You know, over time, because of erosion and things like that, things get lost so we're not really getting a complete picture but there have been some amazing discoveries some from the older history of archaeology and some from the more recent yeah for example the california gold mine discoveries they were made in the 19th century when miners went to the Sierra Nevada mountains in Central California when gold was discovered there. And to get the gold, they were digging tunnels into the sides of mountains. And inside the tunnels, they were finding human artifacts and human bones solidly embedded in layers of rock that modern geologists tell us are over 50 million years old. So these discoveries came to the attention of Dr. J.D. Whitney, who was the state geologist of California. And he published a, a study about them. But it was too much for some of his colleagues to accept. You know, they said, you know, if Dr. Whitney had understood the theory of evolution, he would, he would have known that those discoveries couldn't possibly be true. You know, they're, they're simply too old. So that's something that's gone on for just a, a, a really, really long time, that every time a discovery is made, if it contradicts 
the dominant theory is kind of set aside, so you never really hear about it. So uh, that's one example. Are they just writing off these as archaeological mistakes? Well, I that that's uh, what I cover in my book. In all of these cases, I'll give the standard kinds of objections that are made and and the replies, like what they would tend to say is, well, this is what they do say. They say, well, maybe some Indians were present in the area, in the mining area, you know, some Native American Indians, and they uh, brought some of their stone tools, their mortars and pestles, obsidian spear points and things like that, brought them into the mines and left them there. And, you know, when the miners found them, they, you know, they weren't really from the layers of rock in which they were found, but had been carried in somehow but you know i i did some uh research among historians of the native american peoples in california and they said that that they would not have been entering these mines you know which were being dug by people of another race, really, you know, it was, uh, I mean, it's a sad chapter of American history, what was, was done, but uh, I said they, they wouldn't have gone anywhere near those places, but, um, or they would say they slipped down from some higher level, they were intrusive, but they never explain exactly how. They just raise it as a possibility. So that's generally what the objections are, a list of possible ways in which something could be wrong. So, I mean, my reply to that is to tell the critics, well, it's possible you could be a 3D holographic projection from Mars. I mean, it's possible, yeah. but... I mean, you can't just raise possibilities. You know, you have to show that in a particular case, you have to be able to demonstrate, well, yes, there was a fissure that went from some higher level to some lower level. And then at the, at the top near the fissure, there were artifacts resembling those that were reported. And... You know, there was definitely a way they could have gotten down into the level at, at which they were found. That's the scientific way to proceed. And you know, just to raise, oh, it could have been a mistake. It could have been misdated. It could have been brought in there from somewhere else. That That doesn't really cut it. Isn't there an artifact found in the mines of South Africa that goes back billions of years? Well, that was a very interesting case. Um, most of the cases that I write about, that I document in Forbidden Archaeology are from the professional scientific literature. But there are some cases that aren't reported in the scientific literature, they're reported in ordinary publications that are part of the story, I believe. And so I included some cases from those sources in an appendix to the book Forbidden Archaeology, because the way I was looking at it is if there actually is evidence for extreme human antiquity, that humans existed in the far distant past, then 
here's what we should expect. It should be encountered by professional scientists who will maybe write about it in their scientific literature and dismiss it. But it may also be found by ordinary people, miners, for example, who will report it to someone who writes about it in the newspaper or something like that. Now, that in itself may not be sufficient proof, but I think people should be aware of it. So th this case of these round metallic spheres that were found in a mine in South Africa, near a place called Otostal in the Western Transvaal region, are very interesting. The objects are about one or two inches in diameter. Around the centers of them, there are parallel grooves, sometimes two, sometimes three, or more. And they look like they were manufactured by someone with human-like intelligence, but they're found solidly embedded in mineral deposits that modern scientists tell us are over 2 billion years old, 2.8 billion years old. So that's really kind of astonishing. And the claim I made for them in forbidden archaeology is that until somebody can give me a really good explanation of how those things formed naturally, then I think we have to consider the possibility that they were made by someone with human-like intelligence existing over 2 billion years ago on this planet. And I think there's been a, a case recently where scientists have uh, investigated uh, a, some kind of cosmic object that crashed on Earth a few thousand years ago. And uh, some scientists are saying it may have been an extraterrestrial kind of craft that entered the Earth's atmosphere. And when it was burning, you know, coming through the atmosphere, it threw off these round metallic spheres. You know, so it's a similar case, kind of. You know, they're saying these basically iron-like spheres that they found in the near the path of this object, I think off the coast of New Guinea or somewhere like that. Uh, these are remains of uh, an extraterrestrial craft that uh, crashed on this planet some thousands of years ago. But uh, the South African spheres, one explanation that I've seen given is that, well, the spheres are just concretions that are found in this mineral deposit. And somebody has obviously taken one of those spheres and then using a dental tool or something like that, carved these grooves around them. But I went to South Africa once and I visited the chief mining engineer at the mine where these things were discovered. And he showed me a solid block of this mineral with these groove spheres kind of solidly embedded in the solid rock. You know, some of them protruding halfway from the rock. You know, kind of like raisins and raisin bread or something. You know, and I could see the grooves going around their equators and back into the solid rock. So nobody has given me to this day a really convincing naturalistic explanation of these objects. So 
I think the possibility definitely has to be considered that they are uh, manufactured products. I don't with human-like intelligence. I don't know if you watch the television show Ancient Aliens, but sometimes they'll show things and they'll imply that these had to be made by machines. So when you looked at those grooves, was it evident to you that those grooves couldn't be made by hand but had to be made by machine? Well, it's interesting. Uh, of course, I appeared on some of the early episodes of Ancient Aliens. You know, the first few years uh, I appeared on uh, some of the episodes. But uh, these groove spheres were shown some years ago on a, an NBC television special called The Mysterious Origins of Man. And before NBC agreed to have uh, these things on the air, they said, you have to give them to an independent company of metallurgists and have an analysis by them, you know, some third party. So they were sent to such a company and their report said, we've looked and we can't detect any sign of any metal you know, that was used to engrave these things. In other words, if you want to say they were a hoax, you know, that was recently engraved using some metal tool, like a dental tool or something like that. They, they said, we look at it under you know, high magnification electron microscope or whatever. We can detect no little flakes of metal or anything like that. And they said, we really can't explain how these grooves were actually made. So at least they showed they didn't have any naturalistic explanation for it. They weren't recent hoaxes. So I think that still leaves open, you know, the possibility that they were manufactured somehow in the very, very distant past. So uh um, so if we're That's what I know about those discoveries. So if we're saying that humans did not evolve from apes, are you saying that we've been coexisting with them all along? Well, that's what the evidence actually suggests. If you actually put all the evidence on the table, not just what supports the current dominant theories, that's the picture you get, one of coexistence of different types of beings rather than evolution of one form from the other. In other words, there have always been human beings like us. There have always been apes and monkeys. There have always been some type of intermediate being. And that takes you into a, another topic, topic of Bigfoot and Sasquatch and creatures like that. In other words, evidence for living ape men, which has been widely reported from around the world. In North America, we, we call them Sasquatch, Bigfoot. Other parts of the world, they have similar creatures. They call them by different names. Almas in Central Asia, the Yeti in the Himalayan regions. There are different names for them. But uh, what it amounts to is that uh, apparently some of these creatures who are similar to Neanderthal or Homo erectus or other supposed human ancestors may still be with us 
today. And that's true today. It was true in the past. It's not that from apes and monkeys came hominins or ape men, as they're sometimes popularly called. And then from them, human beings like us. So all three of those varieties have always been around. Isn't there even a finding of a modern human footprint that goes back millions of years? Well, there are several discoveries like that. One of the big ones is um, discoveries that were made in 1979 at a place called Leitoli in the country of Tanzania and East Africa. Mary Leakey, who was a, a prominent lady geologist and anthropologist, she made this discovery, or her team did, and she said in her original report published in National Geographic magazine that the footprints were indistinguishable from anatomically modern human footprints. And the problem was they were found in layers of rock 3,700,000 years old. It's actually solidified volcanic ash. In other words, uh, some volcano had erupted, some layers of ash accumulated on the ground. Then maybe it rained a little bit, it turned into a kind of mud. And the whoever made the footprints was kind of walking across that mud and it left footprints and, that hardened and were covered by sediments and were preserved for millions of years. But the, the key point is that they were described as being like anatomically modern human footprints not just by Mary Leakey, but by paleontologists like Dr. Tim White and others. So how did they explain those footprints? You know, because they were supporters of the theory of evolution. Well, they said there must have existed at that time some kind of ape man, some kind of hominin, some variety of Australopithecus that had feet exactly like modern human feet, and that's how the footprints were made. It's an interesting idea, but uh, scientists have not found any physical evidence to support that. They have the foot bones of Australopithecus and a creature that they know existed during that time. And the foot structure of Australopithecus is different than that of a modern human being. For one thing, the first toe, the big toe, goes out to the side like a human thumb. And the other toes are kind of long, like little human fingers. So they wouldn't make a footprint like a modern human footprint where you have the first toe short and close to the other ones that are also somewhat short. And I've heard some really amusing descriptions of why the footprints look like they do. And we have to keep in mind that we're not talking about one or two footprints. We're talking about the footprints of three individuals kind of walking together. You know, like said, well, the creature must have been walking with its long toes curled under and its first toe pressed against the others like this, and therefore the footprints look human. Uh, I mean, it's just amazing how uh, some scientists will resort to explanations like that to make the evidence fit within the standard paradigm or framework of ideas. It's kind of like they're clinging on to a religion. Yeah. But one thing I, I would like to say is 
that I respect the right of every individual to make up their own mind about these things. All I can expect is to get a hearing. And if people hear what I have to say, and they think, well, that's fine, Mr. Primo. I wish you well. I'm not convinced. You know, that's their right. Uh, and if somebody honestly believes that the evidence in their mind supports the Darwinian theory of evolution, I think they have a perfect right to do that. Where I have a problem is when supporters of that idea have enlist government to force it on everybody else uh, through the monopoly that this group has in the education system in this country and many others. So that's where I have a problem. Uh, I respect the right of each individual to make up their minds about these things, and I respect those decisions, but uh, maybe I'm a bit of a libertarian in, in this sense that I don't think anyone has the right to compel someone else to accept it. The title of your book is Forbidden Archaeology. And for me, forbidden is a pretty strong word. Is it possibly implying that it's something nefarious has been going on? Well, I kind of touch on that in the introduction to forbidden archaeology. Say it's forbidden in the same sense that. Uh, one wouldn't take uh, a chance on going into a body of water where you know we have you know some signs up you know polluted and don't go swimming. You know it's like you have to make up your mind about it. But uh, pointed out that the kind of knowledge filtration that's being discussed in the book Forbidden Archaeology. I specifically use that term, knowledge filtration. It's something that philosophers of science and historians of science have understood for a long time, namely that theoretical preconceptions can influence how scientists treat different categories of evidence that come to their attention. So basically that's what we're talking about. So it's not a satanic conspiracy to suppress truth, you know, which if people knew would cause them to disbelieve in the current theories. Rather, it's something a little more subtle than that, and something that's very well studied in uh, the fields of history and philosophy of science. Um, so that means the scientists that are involved in this aren't thinking they're hiding true knowledge. You know, that they just think we're just being responsible custodians of the evidence. Uh, I may not know exactly what's wrong with this discovery, but I'm sure if I spoke to my colleague down the hall who's a dating expert, he'd be able to tell me exactly what was wrong. So they just kind of assume like that. And, but the result, is pretty much the same as if there were a conspiracy. In other words, the members of the general public don't get the complete set of facts they would need to know in order to make informed decisions about these things. So, do you? No, it's not a conspiracy theory. 
Do you feel that the people at the top of the control of information just truly believe in Darwinism? Or is there some other secondary benefit they're getting out of keeping this idea going? Well, that's a, a very good question. I think it has a lot to do with power. And I think there may be some uh, in something intentional about it at a certain level. Um, and again, I think this goes back to decisions that have been made over many centuries and the relationship between science, government, industry, education. Uh, it, there's been a long, long history that has led up to the current type of civilization that we have on a worldwide basis. And I think a lot of it has to do with power. And there, there are different kinds of power in the world. There's military power, there's economic power, there's political power. There's also intellectual power, which is a very subtle power, but a very real one. And what it allows people who possess this power to do is dictate our sense of identity. And for a long time now, we've been told, well, what you are really is a purely material being. You know, if you want to believe in God and soul and all those things, you can you can do that. But if you want to know the real truth, what you are is a machine made of molecules in competition with each other for survival. And According to a person's sense of identity, their goals and values and objectives in life are kind of formed. So if we go along with this idea that we're meat machines, uh, machines made of molecules, purely material beings, then our goals and objectives in life become very materialistic in the sense that we think that to produce and consume more and more material things in competition with others who are trying to do the same thing, kinds of things, then we get a certain type of society, certain type of economic activity, financial activity, political activity, it becomes, everything becomes based on exploiting the material nature to the maximum extent possible in competing groups, which is why there's, I believe, so much conflict in the world today. But this focus on matter, uh, being able to extract from the manipulation of matter things of value that can be exchanged generates a lot of wealth, but it goes into certain pockets. You know, for, and I think one reason why there's resistance to consciousness studies and spirituality if it goes beyond the certain beyond the level of praying to god for more and more material things when it gets into some other aspect it's not good for the system that's been set up because if everyone had the sense of identity that I am a being of pure consciousness, you're a being of pure consciousness, we're all beings of pure consciousness, 
we're all part of one family, you could say, on that level. No sense in dividing ourselves up into so many competing groups uh, on the basis of nation, race, whatever. And we learn how to satisfy our material needs in the most simple, natural, efficient, and fair and equitable way possible, you would have a different type of civilization that would be based more on developing the resource of consciousness or spirit than consuming in an unsustainable way material resources destroying the planet in the process so i think that is the reason why there's resistance you know to these things because all kinds of institutions have been built up political religious military economic financial industrial based on this concept that our main purpose in life is to exploit the resources of material nature so yeah i think there are people who understand the implications of people having a different sense of identity and i think that's why a lot of this stuff whether it's research into the paranormal extraterrestrials, alternative history and archaeology, it's kept out on the margins and fringes of society and in the main educational institutions, these other types of ideas are promoted. So yes, I think there is some intentionality behind that at some level of society i want to switch gears with you a little bit there i believe is a new species found the homo naledi yes. and and that species reminds me of what some people call the cherokee little people and i'm not sure if you're aware of that story or myth, but there are about three foot tunnels found in western North Carolina in the um, Appalachian areas, especially when they were, I think, building a university out there. They had found all these tunnels, and I think within the Cherokee Indians, there are myths of these little people, which to me kind of sounds of the Homo Naledi. Do you have any comment on that? Well, yes, it's kind of interesting. Yeah, I aware of different people, indigenous peoples in various parts of the world, including North American tribal people, having the idea that there are little people. You know, that's something that's there in a lot of different cultures and wisdom traditions. This Homo Naledi was uh, discovered in a cave system in South Africa. It's part of a, a World Heritage Site called Cradle of Humanity because they had the idea that that's where human beings first arose in South Africa. And there's some very famous sites that are part of that World Heritage Site, like the Sterkfontein Caves, and there was also uh, another set of caves that just some people, cave cavers, you know, were investigating. And you know, they found a chamber of this cave system there that could be entered only by a very, very narrow passageway. And Somehow these cavers, these cave explorers were of small size and they were able to squeeze their way in. 
and they saw there were bones scattered all over the floor of this chamber in this cave. So they, when they got out, they reported it to scientists at, uh, I think, the University of the Witwatersrand in Johannesburg, you know, South Africa. And these scientists organized an expedition, but they, they picked for this uh, expedition, I think six or seven lady archaeologists who were very small in stature. And yeah, because a lot of the men, they're just too big to go through this chamber. So this team of, uh, of uh, lady archaeologists kind of made their way through the very, very narrow passageway and got into the chamber and started collecting the bones. And then they were analyzed and they were all from the same species. And the fact that it was only the bones of this creature that they called Homo naledi that were in this chamber indicated that they had been brought in there deliberately and that there was some kind of ritual that had been performed by members of this species to you know, have a burial or some kind of ceremony at the death of these people and the deposit of their bones in that cave. And uh, because the creature was very small, small in the sense of being maybe a maximum of five feet high, I don't know if that gets down to the size of the little people that the Cherokee were talking about, but it is considered small. And the brain was about one third the size of a human brain. So they decided it was a new species. And it's considered to be about two or 300,000 years old. Initially, they had thought, well, maybe a couple of million, but uh, with further dating studies, they revised the age down. And uh, what what's considered significant about it is that uh, it puts deliberate burials back further in time than most archaeologists were accepting. I think the oldest evidence they had for a deliberate burial was somewhere in the range of about 70,000 years. So this put it you know, further back in time. So I think that's why the discovery attracted some attention among the general public a few months ago, you know, when these things were announced. But as far as uh, indicating another type of humanoid creature existing on this earth, you know, the kind that the Cherokee were talking about, or I think the Ojibwa tribes and more to the north also accept something like that. So, yeah, that's pretty interesting. Species that have disappeared, like the Neanderthal, like these other ape man beings, what happened to them, in your opinion? Well, it's interesting. According to some researchers, they haven't disappeared. They're still around in the form of these ape man like creatures that are spotted from time to time. But uh, I would say nothing really goes extinct. And I'm a 
I accept that our universe, and this gets you down to some fundamental questions about you know cosmology and astrophysics and things like that. But basically, I would say we exist in a consciousness based universe rather than a matter based universe, which means um, there's a lot of intelligence involved in the universe. And a fundamental concept for me is that as beings of pure consciousness, we're different than the bodily vehicles that we occupy, whether it's a Neanderthal vehicle or a Homo sapiens vehicle or any other type of vehicle. And I think there's a whole range of vehicles that are provided for conscious selves to occupy in the material universes, because I think there's more than one. Yeah, there are many universes, but they're all kind of like virtual reality systems. And when you enter a, a virtual reality system, you take on an identity within that virtual reality from among the different types of, of avatars or vehicles that are made available to you by the system. So I would look at the Neanderthal body as a vehicle that's offered to conscious selves because each conscious self has different desires, ambitions that it wants to fulfill. And some vehicles are more suitable for them than others. So I would say, like if I'm in a virtual reality system and I know the history of the system, who's entered it, what type of body they have in the virtual reality system, if I knew that the human vehicle was available in the system, the Neanderthal vehicle was available, the Tyrannosaurus Rex vehicle was available, uh, and I saw that the vehicle is no longer in the present environment, I would simply conclude it's because nobody wants that vehicle at this point. It's still there for anybody who wants it or needs it or deserves it, but it's just not manifest at the present moment, because not because it's not there in the system, but because nobody is choosing or being placed into that particular vehicle. So it's it's a, a different way of thinking about things because we're accustomed to think in terms of matter, these things came into existence by some random process of genetic mutations. And if it disappears, you'll never see it again. Uh, it's, it's a different way of looking at these things. And the kind of, We've been so accustomed by our education system to think of everything as matter-based that it really influences the kinds of thinking we can do about questions like the one you asked. But if we have a more consciousness-based picture of reality, it opens up new possibilities. I don't see why they don't just run an experiment by putting a whole bunch of different chemicals in a pool and keep manipulating those chemicals until they see life just spontaneously occur. Well, I think they have tried that. And what they've gotten is not, I mean, they've been able to, I mean, there was a famous experiment that was done I think originally in the 1950s where somebody did that, you know, put a bunch of gases and chemicals together and, you know, it formed 
you might say, some amino acids, which are the building blocks of life. But it's like, even if you have a few of the building blocks, how do you get you know, an elaborate structure without intelligence? Did they even go did they even go from amino acids to a one-celled organism? Did they make it that far? No, no, they didn't get that far. And they've been at it for a long time. If you go on the web and look for unsolved questions in biology, you'll find that abiogenesis, how you go from matter, which is not biological, to the first biological organism. It's an unsolved problem right to this very day. There are lots of proposals. There may be 40 or 50 different proposals outlining in a very sketchy way how it might have happened, but there's not any consensus even within the mainstream scientific world other than that it must have happened yeah you know, how it happened no consensus i had a conversation with a woman off the air she claims that she has the most neanderthal dna within her body that has ever been but the fascinating thing to me, she told me, was as a person, she never gets sick, and sometimes she has abilities that could be considered psychic. So it makes me kind of wonder, was there some other reason why the Neanderthals disappeared? Well, they may have literally disappeared. Yeah, they have psychic <laughs> abilities. That is one thing uh, that, again, it, it's, it's a different way of thinking if we think of an organism is just a machine made of molecules, then you can't really consider things like this. But if you consider there is a conscious self there, that's the real self, that there is a subtle mental body that has powers beyond the range of the chemical elements, it opens up a lot of possibilities. Um, a lot of people have reported psychic phenomenon in connection with UFOs, not UFOs, definitely UFOs, but we're talking about Neanderthals and other examples of living eight men. Uh, there is a psychic element connected with them, which may explain why nobody's been able to capture one and put it in a zoo for everyone to look at. In the ancient Sanskrit writings of India, there are descriptions of a creature, creatures called Vanaras, means forest dwelling people. And they are described as having ape like bodies but a simple level of human-like culture. In other words, they have a language, they can communicate with humans, and they have uh, a simple level of culture. In other words, they wear some kind of clothing, they have some simple implements and things like that. But it stay, they also have mystic powers you know, the ability to go from place to place, you know, instantaneously to appear and disappear and things like that. So that appears to go along with what you were saying that, yeah, there are these Neanderthal-like creatures, but maybe they have some psychic or, or mystic power that goes along with them. Find this like in Native American Indian cosmology. They talk about human beings and animals having a shadow self, which 
is able to communicate and perceive at a distance so that you know the shadow self of a hunter can maybe detect the presence of an animal you know at some distance away or the shadow self of the animal that's being hunted can detect the presence of the shadow self of the hunter so there's you know kind of a battle going on there it's kind of like we have radar and things like that to detect you know the enemy planes at a distance and vice versa if we get back to consciousness do you feel the planet was seeded like the theory of panspermia, or do you think that collectively, consciously, we just created this place for experiences? Um, a little of each, in the sense that as particles of consciousness, as personal, individual, conscious entities, none of us are from the world of matter. We have a non-material origin from some higher plane of reality. So yes, we've been seeded into this level of reality. And why is that? I would say and that it's because at the present moment, we're not qualified to exist on what I would call the level of pure consciousness, where the ruling principle is unselfish, loving, harmony, cooperation. You know, if, if a conscious self is a little too egotistical, and has the slightest bit of you know, false ego, and you could say that I want to be the controller. And then there has to be some alternative reality for that conscious self to exist in. And this is it. But in the human bodily vehicle, the conscious self has the opportunity to do one of two things. One is to try to continue dominating, controlling, and exploiting matter and other material bodies, or come to the understanding that we're all beings of pure consciousness. We shouldn't be trying to exploit control and dominate each other and the resources of nature and come to some higher understanding and graduate from this level of existence where the conscious self is limited in so many ways and experiences different kinds of unpleasantness and reach that higher domain um so yeah we are seated here we're given freedom of choice to do whatever we want to do and the type of reality that we experience is kind of the sum total of the choices that we make and some people you could say are making choices that lead them i mean to put it you know, very simply the, to the light and some people are making the choices that lead them to the dark side i mean to put it in very simple terms some people say or believe that the modern human is created from et's that manipulated apes into what we are today to use as a labor force what is your opinion on that? There are certain principles involved in that that I accept and certain principles involved in that that I, I don't accept. 
the principle that there is intelligent life throughout the cosmos, not just on Earth, is something that I accept, that there's an extraterrestrial involvement in our presence here. So that I accept. Uh, like I said, in one sense, we're all extraterrestrials, we're all ETs as conscious, intelligent beings. None of us are from here. But as conscious, intelligent beings, I don't think our destiny is to identify with our material bodily vehicles as being the slave race of some other uh, intelligent beings in the cosmos. I, I don't see that. But um, as far as there being an extraterrestrial element to our presence here, yes, I accept that. But I think it goes much further back in time than, you know, the uh, time of, say, Homo erectus, which they usually talk about three or 400,000 years ago. So uh, there are things about that idea that I can identify with, but you know, I think there are things that go beyond that as well, but I also accept. Your first book is called Forbidden Archaeology, The Hidden History of the Human Race. But I think you kind of made a, a stripped down version of that book just called The Hidden History. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah Forbidden Archaeology is 900 pages long, which caused some people when they first encountered it to call it forbidding archaeology because it just was so big that you didn't want to pick it up you know so uh, we brought out an abridged edition all the same cases but just explained in a shorter way and that book was called the hidden history of the human race and it's about 300 pages long but I was very surprised that as time went on, people were buying more of the 900 page book than the 300 page book. Because it seemed, I guess, that people who were interested in the topic wanted everything. <laughs> you know, they thought if they're getting to, a bridge version, they're missing out on something. I was really surprised. I thought the uh, shorter edition would sell much better. Well, you know, they. I think you're right. They wanted the full, complete text, at least in their minds. They didn't want to miss out on anything. Yeah. Seems like that's the case. If people it want to find... They said it got translated into about 26 different languages. Including some of my books in Chinese. Have you tracked the sales in China? I'd be curious to see how popular it is yeah. over there. I don't know how popular it was. I haven't heard that it's... I mean, sometimes once a book gets published, you don't know what the sales figures are. Because the original contract with the publisher will usually be for five or 10000 copies and then they have an option to renew but who's checking really you know well isn't this year the 30th anniversary of that book uh actually it is that's amazing it was first published in 1993 it's kind of become a, a generic name you know forbidden archaeology I mean, there are forbidden archaeology conferences and things like that. Kind of, it's become a, a generic name for a certain genre of of literature and investigation. So that's that's interesting.
If people want to find that book and all your others, do they do that from your website or Amazon? Well, of course, Amazon is there, I think. Uh, if they get it from my website, I may benefit more, but it's up to the individual. But my books are available on my website, mcremo.com, m-c-r-e-m-o.com. Along with, you know, there's a schedule link for upcoming lectures. Like in November, I'll be at a conference called Stairway to the Stars in Las Vegas at the Luxor Hotel there. Um, they can find a schedule of upcoming interviews, such as this one would have been mentioned. Well, when it's scheduled, mm -hmm. it'll be mentioned. Uh, so, uh, yeah, that's a good place for people to start. Books are available on Amazon, and uh, digital form is ebooks and print books. Is there anything that you're working on that you want us to know about? Well, <clears throat> I would like people to know that forthcoming is uh, a follow-up book to Forbidden Archaeology, but that's, don't want to say too much about it right now because it's not physically available yet. There's still some things we're working on to complete. But uh, that's forthcoming. Well, that's another reason for me to get you back. And I would love to have you back to talk about your book, Human Devolution. Yeah, I'd love to talk about human devolution. Michael, before we finish up, can you leave us with one positive message? Or actually, one last positive message? My positive message would be respect the right of each individual to make up their minds about these things, but don't be afraid to make up your own mind and stand up for or represent what you believe to be the case. So, and don't, don't become discouraged you know, if not everyone accepts what you say or represent. Michael, thank you for that message, and thank you again for being my guest. You're welcome. Thanks for watching the Jeff Mara Podcast. I really appreciate you. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. And if you do, there are loyalty badges and other perks depending on your level of membership. All you need to do is click the join button underneath the video to find out more. Thank you for your support.